all. My name is Sarah and I work in the Smith Group at Indiana University and today I'm going to be talking about some basics of setting up cyclic voltammetry experiments. So the first thing that we think of is the setup of our cell. The whole cell consists of three electrodes. So we have our working electrode, our reference electrode, and our counter electrode. Um, we've immerse those in a solvent plus an electrolyte solution, and we stir that uh, between experiments. Um, another thing we wanna think about when setting up our physical cell is that we wanna minimize the distance between the working electrode and the reference electrode. That minimizes the resistance in solution and gives us more accurate potentials. So getting into the specifics of the electrodes, first I'll start with the working electrodes. So there are a lot of types of working electrodes we can use and a lot of them have different benefits and different downsides. The first I'll talk about is a mercury electrode. Now, obviously mercury electrodes aren't very common anymore, but um, they're useful at negative potentials because they have a very large over potential for proton reduction. So that means you have a large negative window that you can use for experiments where you're interested in reduction, where you're not going to see interfering proton reduction. However, they have poor performance at positive oxidizing potentials because the mercury surface, ex surface itself is oxidized. So here's um, a picture of a dropping mercury electrode. There are also hanging mercury drop electrodes, mercury film electrodes, and mercury pool electrodes. Um, the nice thing about this dropping mercury electrode is that it has a constantly renewable surface. So if your surface is being affected by the chemistry you're doing, you just have a new drop and that renews the surface. Uh, next is heavy metal electrodes, so platinum, gold, and rhodium. These have a larger positive potential range than mercury, but you can have oxide film formation on their surface. And they have a limited negative potential range because proton reduction is, reduction is much easier at these electrodes than at a mercury electrode. So platinum in particular, its reductive window is particularly obscured by proton reduction. Uh, the most common electrode type is probably carbon. It has a pretty wide potential range compared to both mercury and platinum because it has a wide both positive, oxidative, and negative reductive window. Um, the examples of this are glassy carbon. So that's over here. You can see the structure of that. Carbon rods, carbon cloths, and this is a reticulated vitreous carbon. This is particularly useful in um, longer term experiments because it has an extremely si high surface area. Finally, um, silver electrodes are also used, but they're mostly used for cathodic processes um, and they can accumulate films as well so that you have to carefully clean them. Next is reference electrodes. So we need reference electrodes to be non-polarizable so that we always know what potential we're at. We need them to be chemically stable and suitable in a variety of solvents so that we can use a solvent of our choice. Um, common examples are a calomel electrode, a silver-silver chloride electrode, which is really nice in aqueous solution, a hydrogen electrode, saturated ca cadmium amalgam electrodes that are in DMF that are saturated with cadmium chloride and sodium chloride. Next, we want to think about our solvents um, of our solution in our cell. And when we're thinking about solvents, we want to choose a solvent that has a wide potential range so that we're not reducing or oxidizing our solvent instead of our species of interest that's in the solvent. We also want our solvent to have a high enough dielectric constant that we can dissolve supporting electrolyte in it. That's so that we can conduct electrons throughout our solution, right? Um, we also need to think about acid-base properties of our solvent, like is our solvent going to deprotonate our species of interest, or is our solvent going to be deprotonated by our species of interest, right? We also want to think about the cost of our solvent, the spectral window, if you're interested in doing spectroelectrochemistry, 
the ease of purification because we often want um, water free solvents, the solvent stability, temperature range and viscosity. And here are some dielectric constants for some common solvents. And you can see that we don't really ever work in benzene as a solvent for CV because its dielectric constant is so low. Um, but people do work in tetrahydrofuran, dichloromethane, methanol, and water and acetonitrile because those dielectric constants are high enough to dissolve supporting electrolyte in solution. Um, like I said, some common solvents. The protic solvents are water, methanol, and ethanol. And the aprotic solvents are DMF, acetonitrile, DMSO, T DCM, and THF. And here are some of their... Uh, dielectric constants. These aprotic solvents may need to be rigorously dried for non-aqueous experiments, and we can do that through a variety of ways. Um, if we want to use them in like a glove box, they'll have to be pretty dry before they can be put into the glove box. And having adventitious water in those systems can greatly change the reactivity, so you need to make sure those solvents are rigorously dried. Um, and in those solvents, if you're doing a reaction that needs a proton source, you may need to add an external proton source, such as acetic acid. Next, I'll talk about our electrolytes. Um, we want to think about the influences that they have on the structure of the double layer. So our electrolyte helps us move electrons from the electrode to our species in solution, right? And it consists of a ion pair of a positive ion and a negative ion. So if we're applying a negative potential at our electrode, we're going to attract the positive ion of our electrolyte to our electrode surface, so that affects the double layer structure. Um, we also want a wide potential range here. Again, you want to be reducing your species of interest and not your electrolyte. And then interactions between our solvent and our electrolyte, electrolyte can affect the cell resistance and ion pairing. Another um, consideration is buffering capacity. Some, some electrolytes are capable of buffering your solution. So phosphate buffer is a good example of that. We also want to think about costs, recrystallization, because you want to have pure electrolytes so you don't have any contamination of your solution. You want to be able to dry that electrolyte, and you want it to be chemically stable. You need an electrolyte that will have a solubility of at least 0.1 molar to minimize the resistance of the system. And if the dielectric constant of your solvent is lower, you may need more than 0.1 molar. For example, THF has a pretty low dielectric constant compared to like acetonitrile, so you may need as much as 0.4 molar um, electrolyte in a low dielectric constant system. Now for aqueous systems, there are a lot of really common uh, electrolytes like KCl, KBr, sodium sulfate, um, a lot of perchlorate salts, um, sodium chloride, sodium bromide, as well as buffered systems. So like citrate buffer, acetate buffer, phosphate buffer, borate buffer, and lots of other buffers. In organic systems, we're really fond of these um, tetrabutyl ammonium salts or really any tetraalkyl ammonium salts. Um, the most common is TBAPF6, which is shown here. We also have TBA tosylate salts. You can get some perchlorates and TBA BPH4 into organic systems. So I hope you learned a little bit about the basics of CV cell setup.